chapter 13, Gravitation. So I am working through uh, chapter summaries for uh, Halliday, Resnick, and Walker, 9th edition. And this is going to be a stopping point for me because uh, up through chapter 13 is stuff that I think would almost always be covered. Not necessarily all of this because it's a lot in the first semester introductory calculus-based physics course. And if you're using a different book, it's pretty much the same thing, uh, different orders. Uh, and chapter 13 is where... I think once you get to that, it's covered most of the stuff. Fluids and other things are a little bit later, and um, those aren't always covered. I will make those, but I need to do some other things first. So let's just get to it. Gravitation, that's what that's the title um, from the book. I don't really like that. It's kind of weird. And it starts off with the idea of gravity as an interaction between two objects. And it writes this. It says F equals g, I think it says m1, m2, over r squared. So this says that the force between two objects of mass m1 and m2, separated by their centers, a distance r, would be g, the product of the masses, divided by the distance between them squared, and g is a constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons meter squared per kilogram squared. Okay, so that's that's the first thing. Now, it's not terribly, and it's not really wrong, but that's a scalar version of the equation. And if you want to do more useful stuff, you can get by a lot of cases by just using that. But it's not a vector. Um, we can make it a vector if we choose to, and I choose to. So let's put my origin right here. I have two masses, A and B. They have mass MA and MB. Just, just so you can. And then I could have this. I'm going to call RA. That's the location of the center for object A. And this is RB. Now let's say I want to calculate the gravitational force on B. I need, it's going to be, uh, I need this distance right there. I, in fact, need that vector. I'm going to draw that as a vector R, a vector R. And so now it looks like a displacement vector. So I could say R, or a subtraction, is final minus initial. R is going to be RA minus RB. But I need to put that in here, and I cannot square a vector. So you actually need to take the magnitude of it. So let's say this, F, and this is going to be FB. It's a, it's a force on B. I'm going to say G. M A, M B, still those are scalars, divided by the magnitude of R squared. But we still see a problem, right? Because that's a vector, scalar, 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 scalar. So I don't have the vector. So I'm going to put a negative sign here and R hat. That is a good equation right there. So just a reminder, um, if I have a vector R, I can find the unit vector in the direction of r. So it's a vector of length 1 in that direction. r hat would be the vector r divided by the magnitude of the vector r. But, the, but the doing that makes this whole side a vector, so it's much better that way. And the negative side means that, I'm sorry, this would be b, I want this vector, b minus a, there, I fixed it. Okay, but that's the universal uh, law of gravity. Um, let me, let me just, they have a thing in there about spheres. Uh, if I have a sphere of radius, let's say R, and I'm over here, and I want to find the gravitational force on an object there, this sphere, as long as you're, it's uniformly distributed, or at least spherically distributed, uh, acts like it's all at the center, a point mass at the center. So that allows us to deal with uh, finite size objects. Now, why is that? It's a little bit more difficult to say. Um, you need some more advanced math to show that. Uh, you know, I guess Gauss's Law, Green's Theorem, Stokes' Theorem. Uh, I don't remember which one for some reason. Uh, you can show that numerically too, it's kind of fun. But uh, I'm just, just gonna say, if, if, it's a, if it's a finite size sphere, uh, it acts like the point mass at the center of the sphere. Okay, one last thing that's kind of fun. If this is the Earth, uh, I'm not going to put the numbers in. The radius of the Earth 
and the mass of the Earth, then an object on the surface would have a gravitational force. I'm going to use a scalar value. Uh, F is G, mass of the Earth, over the radius of the Earth squared times the mass of the object. Right? Um, and it doesn't really matter. The, the, the distance from here to there is like 6 million meters. And so if you're up or down, you know, 100, 200 meters, it's still the same distance. And it turns out that this value right here, if you put in g mass of the Earth over r squared, we call that g, and it's approximately equal to 9.81 newtons per kilogram. And then if I multiply that by mass, I get newtons. Um... So I'm going on a little bit out of, out of order here, but I, I will say this. Uh, they have this thing about gravitational acceleration. So let's say in one dimension, uh, no, let's write it the real way. F negative G M A M B over the magnitude of R squared R hat. That's my gravitational force, and that's equal to mass times acceleration. And this, if I want to, let's say that one of the objects is so massive that I don't really need to worry about the gravitational force changing, even though it's still true, uh, even if that one does move, then these masses cancel, and I get the acceleration in, as g m over r is squared in that r hat direction. And so you see I called that g, and, and I think that's fine, right? g It's going to be g, even if you're on the surface of the Earth. Now, what do you call that? Do you call g the acceleration due to gravity, because it does have units of acceleration, due to gravity, and that would be units of meters per second squared, or is it the gravitational field? In units of newtons per kilogram. I mean, I'm not going to judge anyone that does it one way or the other, but I really like this way better. If we think about G as the gravitational field, the force per unit mass, uh, it matches up much better with the electric field you're going to see later, which is the force per unit charge, uh, and it just makes more sense. You know, and, and, and I always say, well, if I have a block right here, and I have a gravitational force Mg, and a normal force, is that the acceleration due to gravity? Well. Not really, because it's not accelerating. It's just sitting there, right? It is, it's much better to think about it in terms of the gravitational field. But that's just me. You do what you do. Uh, next thing is superposition. Uh, so this just says if I have two or more objects and I want to find the gravitational force on some small object right there, or it could even be big, it doesn't matter, then I have a gravitational force due to this one. I'll call that A call that B. Let's call that FA, and this is FB, and it says that the net force is just the sum of those. FA, that's F, plus FB. And that's why, if you, if you actually think about it, when we, when we talk about the gravitational force outside of a large sphere, we're actually adding up all the forces due to all the pieces of the sphere. They're different distances away, and you, that's how you show that it's the same as at the center. I mean, it's not an easy calculation. I wouldn't suggest you do that because you're just using this equation. Uh, so this, and then they have a thing, this textbook has a thing about what if you're on the inside of the sphere. Um, it turns out if I move to this location anywhere along that part inside of a sphere, the gravitational force only depends on the stuff closer to the center. That stuff doesn't matter. Um, at this point, it's just like saying, just believe me, trust me that it's true. Uh, but it, it's the same thing as with Gauss's law um, for electric fields, and you'll do that probably in the next semester. Okay, uh, energy. Um, so, you know, this, and I don't think they have, let me check, do they have orbits in here too? And they didn't have orbits, so that's kind of strange. Okay, so this idea of universal gravity as its own chapter, I mean, a lot of times this would be put in gravity and uh, the potential energy due to this gravitational force would be in, in a later chapter, but that's fine. So remember that 
uh, delta u is defined as negative uh, 1 to 2, point 0.1 to point 0.2, f dot dr. If the force, if the work done does not depend on the path, then you can do this. Uh, so let's do this uh, the way they always do it. Suppose I have a planet of mass m, and I'm over here. And I want to calculate the work going from here, an infinite distance away, over there. I want to integrate from uh, here to here. So let's call this point 1 to point 2. Um, yeah, and I always get the, I'm, I might make a minus sign here, and that's fine. Uh, so let's call this the r direction. So that dr, the vector, is just going to be dr in the r direction. And then my gravitational force, F, is going to be uh, negative g m1, I guess, ma, uh, ma, mb, uh, r hat over r squared. So if I find f dot dr, I can do that. It's just going to be this times this. They're in the same direction. So I just get negative g m a m b over r squared dr. Now I can integrate that to find the change of potential. So delta u is going to be from point 0.1 to point 0.2, negative g m a m b r squared dr. And so all this stuff is just a constant negative g m a m b um, not over r and then if i integrate this i get negative one over r right because if i had if i do the opposite the inverse derivative and this is uh one over r i'd get a negative one over r squared so this is going to be a uh, negative r and with the dr from point one r equals infinity to point two r equals r prime let's just go to some location called r prime uh, and we're going to set, we're going to say that at infinite distance away, the potential is equal to zero. So that means that this is going to be equal to G M A. I didn't include that negative sign. See, I told you I was going to make a mistake. No, it should be negative. Negative G uh, M A M B over R prime, but I'm just going to switch it back to R. And that's your gravitational potential energy with respect to infinity. So it's not too difficult to derive. Okay. And the negative sign is really important. Uh, if you think for a couple reasons, number one, if you think back to uh, the relationship between potential and force, we had a negative sign. So that negative sign makes the, the force uh, attractive. Um, number two, we want the potential to be at infinity zero but we also want it to de the potential energy to decrease as you get closer to this and the only way to do that is to have a negative potential so now you can use this potential energy for all your work energy problems that we had before and let's they do one um called <clears throat> escape velocity it's a, it's, a, it's a let's do this equation so suppose i have a planet it's my own planet has a radius r and a mass big M. And then I have some object right here. And I, I shoot it up with the initial velocity. This will be big M. And this is a little m. With initial velocity v1. So this object's going to go up and then come back down. Okay. Uh, but if I shoot it fast enough, it's going to go an infinite distance away where the potential is equal to zero and I'll have a final velocity of zero. And that's what we call escape velocity. So if you just have a constant gravitational field, mg, you cannot escape. It will always come back down. But since the gravitational force decreases with r, you actually can't escape. So let's set this up as a problem. System is m1 plus m. And that's this lowercase m. So both of the objects. Remember, you have to have two objects to have a potential energy. Uh, there's no work done on it. So the work would be the change in kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy equals zero. So zero equals K2 minus K1 plus U2 minus U1. So right here we have something nice. Over here, the kinetic energy is zero. It's stopped. 
so k2 is 0. And it's an infinite distance away, so u2 is 0. So I get 0 equals minus 1 half mv1 squared uh, minus u1, which is minus g m m over r, right? The radius of the planet, that's where it starts. And that has to equal to 0. So that's, these cancel, make a plus. And I want to solve for v1, so I get uh, 1 half m v1 squared equals g m big M over r. Uh, this mass cancels. Multiply by 2 and divide and take the square root. I get v1 equals the square root 2 g big M over r. And this is the escape velocity. This is if you start with this velocity at the surface, you will get to a point where you do not come back. If you go greater than that velocity, you will not come back and you'll still be moving. Okay. Notice here something really important. It doesn't matter what direction you're going because this is a scalar equation. If you launch this way, you will still, at the same velocity, you will still escape. It'll take a different path, but you'll still escape. And that's kind of cool. Uh, you can use this, uh, the one fun thing, and I'm not going to do it. Use this to find out. Uh, you'll notice that as you get smaller, as the, as the radius gets smaller, the escape velocity gets greater okay, if you keep the mass constant. And if you get this down small enough keeping the mass constant, you can actually get an escape velocity equal to the speed of light. And that's how you find the, the minimum, the, this is the maximum size, the maximum size of a black hole, where light, the escape is velocity is greater than the speed of light. Okay, one last thing. And I don't know why they put this in here. Uh, Kepler's laws. I mean, I love Kepler's laws because it has a whole bunch of cool stuff. So let's imagine that I have a star. And I have something orbiting it. Not circular. So Kepler, so it's going this way. Kepler's first law says that this is an ellipse. That's what it says. It says planets orbit an ellipse. And the ellipse is such that the sun, this assumes, great assumption here, that the mass of the planet is much smaller than the star uh, so that the star does not move appreciably. So this is an ellipse with uh, the star at one of the focus points. That's the first one. Number two uh, is the equal areas. This is Kepler's second law. This says that uh, as it moves closer over here, if you took a month of time and you looked at this area that it swept out, and then you compare that to over here a month of time where it swept out, this is moving slower, but it's got a longer r. This area and that area are the same. That's the equal areas. It's, it's the same as saying uh, L equals constant. And you thought I wasn't going to put a vector over that, but I did. The angular momentum of this as it moves around is constant. It's the same thing. So in order to uh, conserve angular momentum, since R decreases over here, it has to move faster. And then finally, we have this. T squared proportional to r cubed. This says that the time it takes to orbit is proportional to the, this is actually the, the time it takes to orbit squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. Um, let me do this one for a circular orbit, because a circle is, is an ellipse, and then I'll stop. Okay, I do have uh, more details about Kepler's laws uh, at a much more advanced level, uh, if you want those just search for them because I'm not going to link them down below. I'm just going to say, I'm going to link them down below, but who am I kidding? I'm not going to do that because I, I'm, I forget things. Okay, so let's do, this will be useful. Here is a planet, and here is something orbiting it a distance r away. So the only force acting on it is the gravitational force. Uh, so in the r direction, I can say f net r is going to be equal to negative g 
mass of the planet, mass of the thing over r squared. And that's going to be equal to, it's moving in a circle at a constant speed because it's in a circle. That's going to be equal to an acceleration of negative m v squared over r. Right. So remember that this is the acceleration of an object moving in a circle and it's pointed towards the center. So both of those are true. Now, and I actually can write it like this, negative m omega squared r, where that's the angular velocity. You don't have to put it that way, but let's do it that way. Okay, so now let's solve for omega. So the negative signs cancel, m cancels, and I can divide by r. I get omega squared is going to be equal to g m over r cubed because I divide both sides by r. Now, omega is t uh, 2 pi over the period, right? Because uh, the angular velocity is, it goes around 2 pi radians in one orbit, and that's the time t, and that whole thing is squared. So now I, I want to solve for t, so it's going to be 4 pi squared over t squared. And I'm going to, let's just cross multiply, even though I hate saying that, that's actually what I'm doing. I get, actually I'm just gonna multiply by t squared, and then I'm gonna get uh, four pi squared over g m times r cubed. And you'll notice that uh, for a given planet, four is constant, pi is constant, g is constant, m is constant, and then you get Kepler's third law. Now, if you want to do that for an ellipse, it's not quite so trivial, but this one's not so bad. Okay, so again, if you want to look at the rest of the playlist for, for the first semester of calculus-based physics using Halliday Resident Walker, the, the playlist is down below. I will continue this series. I will return, just like Luke said to Yoda at the end of Empire Strikes Back, or the middle. I will return, and he did, right? Return of the Jedi, he came back. I'm going to come back. I just got a lot of things to do before my next semester. I'm working on a couple of other chapter summaries, classical mechanics, another textbook too. So um, just, just hold on there. And if you're seeing this two years from now, it doesn't really matter. I'll probably have done it. So it's cool. All right. Have fun with your physics.